Well, uh, let's look to God's word this morning. And if you were here last week, uh, we shared with you uh, about a place called There. And a, a place called There is very important. It's a place that Mary and Joseph had to go. What happens there? It's the place where your days are accomplished and you deliver your baby. Amen. How many of you here are carrying a baby? You're carrying, you're carrying a promise. You're carrying God's purpose. You're carrying God's seed. And God wants us to find a place called there because there is God's designated place where we give birth. And like uh, Mary and Joseph, we can't give birth where we want to. They, they, it would have been a lot more convenient if they would have just had their baby in, in Nazareth, wouldn't it? Or Jerusalem, but they had to travel to a specific place at a specific, specific time. And the place of there was Bethlehem. And in the same manner, every one of us, this is profound, simple but profound, every one of us are carrying a prophetic seed. We're carrying God's purpose that is yet to be birthed. And we're on this journey, and when you look at their situations and circumstances, you look at the cast of characters and the whole journey, you see that that speaks to us and is an example for us of how we walk and we are on a journey to give birth to what God has placed within us. And it's individuals, it's corporately. And so uh, there was a great, uh, there was a decree that brought great pressure and taxing upon the people and it pressed Joseph and Mary out of their comfort zone to get them there. And we're living in some press, uh, pressing times, aren't we? We're living in some difficult times. We're subject to decrees from people in authority. And we have to recognize and look beyond whether we feel it's right or wrong. We need to respond to it and, and understand that God is using it to get us to a place called there so we can give birth. So stay on your donkey. I mean, Mary had many temptations. She could have said, this is ridiculous. How long is this going to be? Could there be another way? And she had to stay on that donkey till she got there. She had to get to the stable. She could not deliver before that. Thank God she had a testimony. Let it be, let it be, let it be according to your word, O oh God. And if God has impregnated you with a prophetic word, with a promise, you have got to declare, let it be, let it be. I'm going to believe your word above every situation and circumstance, no matter how miserable this journey may get on this donkey. Hallelujah, I'm, giving, I'm going to go there. And don't stop at the end. You cannot birth what God has put in you in the religious structure of the inn. They don't know how to handle people like you. They can't receive what you've been impregnated with. Like everything God's birth on this earth that is truly of him and has value, it happens in a stable. It happens in the lowly place, right? It happens where people aren't looking and, 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 and giving you great accolades and, 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 and great fanfare. No, no, no. God's always chosen the lowly place, the stable, the place of humility. Amen. Our there is this region. Are there as we looked at in Psalm 76. But I want to I want to move beyond all that. And so uh, I want to share with you about uh, shepherds in their field and wise men following a star. Does that sound good? It's a good Christmas message. And so let's look at uh, Matthew chapter 2, verse 1 through 11. It's just, you know, it's the it's the Christmas story, or I should say nativity. Now, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, where is he, <coughs> excuse me, this born king of the Jews? <coughs> For we have seen his star in the east, and we are come to worship him. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled in all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests, scribes of the people together, he demanded of them, where is this Christ? Where should he be born? And they said unto him in Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, and thou Bethlehem in the land of Ju Judah, are not thou least among the princes of Judah? For out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had privately or privately called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared, and he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child, for when you have found him, bring me word again that I may also worship him. 
And when they had heard the king, they departed. And lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them till it stood over the, where the young child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother, fell down, worshipped him, and they opened their treasures and presented unto him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. Amen. Now, I want to share with you this morning about the value and the necessity and the blessings that God gives us in shepherds. And this is not meant in any way to be self-serving, trust me, <clears throat> but it's powerful principles and teaching that helps us to, to, really, uh, to really fulfill what God's called us to do, to be, to, be, uh, to, to be productive and fruitful in the kingdom. And I want you to look even beyond this uh, in another aspect. I think every pastor... A true pastor or shepherd or shepherds in their heart is the desire that all of God's people come to that place where they pastor themselves, right? God wants us to grow and mature and come to a place where we will always need a person called a shepherd or pastors in our midst because they serve a wonderful purpose in our lives. But God wants us to mature and grow in our relationship with him where we learn how to pastor and shepherd our own lives. And then in turn, we become pastors and shepherds. Every one of you are called to shepherd or pastor. Different individuals, different people in your lives, different spheres of influence. And so God wants the church to grow and mature. And so keep all this in mind as we share these principles today, okay? Now I want to look at one more, one more scripture, Luke chapter 2, verse 8. And let's read this. And there were in the same country shepherds. We just looked at wise men. And look at these shepherds. There were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And, and this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there, with, there was, uh, the, suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest. Peace on earth, goodwill toward men, right? <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> now, I want to share a few thoughts with you about the wise men. Those of you that have been around for a while, you know my... My little ditty, my little take on the wise men. And I, I don't say it to try to, you know, be controversial or say it to be, you know, like we've got some little special corner on truth. But it is something really to consider, and I share it for a reason. And it's something I learned a long time ago. And uh, as, as, as I've learned, what I'm going to share with you very briefly, just a moment, is that Oftentimes, what we learn and what we believe is more tradition than what is based in the Word, what's scriptural. And uh, many, many uh, theologians, many great teachers and scholars of, of, the, of the Bible, and this was taught many, many, many decades and centuries up until the present time. We seem to have lost this. But it seems as if the wise men really never did get to the, to the uh, manger. They never really got to the stable. And I, I can't just pull all that apart. <laughs> but I want you to just keep in your heart. We need to be open. How much tradition do we hold on to? Uh, how many of you know Jesus probably wasn't a carpenter? Oh, I worry we going with all this. Well, you can blame Pat Black for that. <laughs> no, I'm just... <laughs> But she gave me an article a couple years ago, and it was so eye-opening. And it really said, tradition has just said Jesus was a carpenter, but in fact, he was a, <clears throat> a stonemason, Cliff. Yeah, he was a stonemason. The word craftsman is the original word, and it is translated uh, uh, into, they, it was translated stone, uh, carpenter, but it really is a, a stonemason. And when you study, uh, you can see all the, you know, all the um, metaphors and all the, all the ways Jesus referred to as a stone and all the things about living stones and the fact that there really wasn't any wood in, in uh, Nazareth, but fruit trees were, were valuable. Anyway, point being, there's a lot of tradition. 
And so you may look and say, yeah, but my Hallmark Christmas card has three wise men, right? Come on, who are you going to believe? Here's the point. The Bible says that the wise men, they came to the house and they brought their gifts into the house and they found the young child. And that is a different word than infant. Apparently, they showed up a couple years later. And, and so just, just hold on to that, okay? Trust me. We don't need to go into a whole lot. So much tradition. How many of you know Jesus was not born on December 25th? We all get that, right? We're not celebrating his birthday. We're celebrating his birth. And that's a good thing. There's nothing wrong with celebrating the birth of Jesus. It's very highly unlikely that he was born on the 25th of December. And we've been told that, you know, that, that's, that date was chosen by the early Roman church. And they chose it because uh, they, wanted a, they wanted a holiday, a Christian holiday, to counteract, you know, the, uh, the, the solstice, the winter solstice that the pagans uh, celebrated. So they said, let's celebrate Jesus' birth on the 25th. And so there's nothing wrong with that. I think it's fine. How many of you like Christmas? Sure, it's a good thing. Why do, why do we celebrate Christmas? Because we like it. It's a good thing. I don't know any time of the year when people's hearts aren't more open, carols are being sung. It seems like there's more of an openness. Sure, it's been commercialized and we've got all the negativity, but it's still, it's still a special time. And so I really feel that we need to we need to embrace that. I know people in the church that say, Christmas, don't celebrate Christmas, right? Don't celebrate Christmas. It's a pagan holiday. It has nothing to do with it's not in the Bible. And then you have people that get overboard and celebrate it too much like the world does. And I think either way you go, it could be a religious spirit. Really, it could be a religious spirit either way. And that's why I believe Paul summed it all up. He wrote to the Colossians. He said, listen, one man esteems and honors one day above another day. He honors a Sabbath above a different person's Sabbath. He honors a feast above another feast. He says, listen, let it be according to what you want to do. Boy, that's a real liberty, isn't it? So thank God. Hallelujah. We can celebrate Christmas. Amen. But one thing I'm not real keen on, let me look around. It's the fat guy with the little red and white suit. Why am I worried about looking around? You know why? Because it's a lie. Right? Isn't it interesting? Santa Satan, same five letters, kind of mixed up a little bit. You know what the problem is with Santa? It's a lie. And we tell our kids, well, the, 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 um, the, uh, the Easter bunny's coming on Easter, and the tooth fairy's going to put a quarter. That's what I used to get. I don't know what they give now, but inflation, you know. But, and, and the tooth fairy's going to put something under your pillow. And, uh, and, of course, Santa's coming on Christmas, and Jesus is going to come again. And then the kid gets of age, our children get of age, and they get the revelation, right? Come on. They get the revelation, it's not real. And, and, and you say, well, yeah, you know, well, the Easter bunny, well, we were just fibbing. We, it's just playing with, uh, you know, the tooth fairy and Santa, you know. But what about Jesus? If you're going to lie to me about the others, what makes me think Jesus is real? No, there's a real truth in that. And we need to get a hold of that, amen? Pastor Lou's a Grinch and a Scrooge. <laughs> Merry Christmas. I know one thing. It's all about giving. It's more blessed to give than to receive. Oh, God, help us just to find our joy and fulfillment in giving to God, giving him worship, honor, blessing other people in the name of the Lord. Amen. That'll take a lot of pressure off, won't it? Anyway, praise God. Oh, yeah, let's look at these guys. Let's look at the wise men. God never appeared to wise men. He never spoke to the wise men. He appeared and spoke to shepherds. See, the wise men followed a star because they were astrologers. They studied the stars and all that, and they were intelligent people. They're studying the signs in the sky. And folks, there's nothing wrong with the uh, constellations, are there? God established the constellations. As a matter of fact, they tell the story of the gospel. They tell the story of Christ. They tell the story in star clusters. Come on. 
uh, of, of the story of Christ. That's why the Bible says the heavens declare his glory. So let's don't get all stirred up and, and, and confused and bewildered when the devil comes along and perverts that with something called astrology, right? What's amazing to me is God is not intimidated. intimidated. God will meet any man where they're at, even if they're on the wrong road, even if they have no understanding, they're ignorant of his ways. As long as their heart is open, he will meet them and speak to them. This is just, that's just amazing. So the wise men did not come, they did not come to Jesus by a commandment from God, and they were not carrying a heavenly message. They were following a star. And if I was a person, a pagan or what have you, and I saw a star, and I realized that there is a king, it, 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 it spoke in my tradition, uh, that star spoke that a king was being born, then I would go where most people logically would go. If they're looking for a king, I would go to a palace. I would go to Herod's palace. And that's exactly where they went. Now, when God is ready to reveal himself, when he's ready to reveal his son on the earth, whenever that is, however that is, whatever age that has been in, he does not choose the wise of the world. He doesn't choose politicians and, and kings and great people of influence. I believe he's looking for a people that will abide. He's looking for a people, come on, that, 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 that abide in their fields. He's looking for a humility and a brokenness and a simplicity. I don't know about you, that, re that really blesses me. The Bible says, not many wise, not many, come on, wise or noble or chose, but God looks for the broken, the humble, the base. I don't know if that applies to you, but that's my hope. God didn't choose me because I was wise, noble, intelligent, or any of that. I, he looked beyond all that and saw a weakness, a frailness, and he said, I'll take you. I can use you. Amen. He can use you, but there's a key here that we're going to look at this morning. If we're going to hear God, be part of what God is doing, we have to be people like shepherds. We, not, we have to not only commit and understand our relationship with shepherds, but we need to understand we in the same manner are called to be shepherds, and there is a characteristic of that, and that is that we are people that are faithful, that learn how to abide in our fields, care for one another. How's that sound? Isn't that a lot better than having to be high and noble and mighty and intelligent and educated? It sure does for me. So... At the same time, listen, this is important. The wise men are still significant and they're prophetic symbolically to us because it speaks of kings bringing treasures into the house to worship Jesus. What does Isaiah say in Isaiah 60? It says that God is going to raise up the kings and the, and the Gentiles and they're going to bring the riches of the world into the house of God. There's a significance in all that, which is not something we need to look at right now. But here's what I want you to see. God loves shepherds. And whenever he's about to speak again from the heavenlies, whenever he's ready to move again, bring a fresh word, this is going to be important to hear. I'm going to try my best to try to clarify this. But God speaks through faithful shepherds. Shepherds. Wow. Who will abide? We must learn how to abide. And I'm really concerned. Uh, I'm concerned about the church in America because in many ways we've, we've, we've taken on more of the characteristics of a corporate church, of the corporate world rather, of business. And uh, there, there are folks, none of you, of course, but there are folks that go to church and, and, and they're caught up in that whole concept and, and they serve and they do what they do to be noticed or to get ahead, or to receive some kind of a title or position, and uh, maybe they'll say, well, okay, I'll serve, and I'll, and I'll do the nursery, and I'll work as an usher, and I'll help clean the church, and, and really it's a stepping stone to the next place, and, and I'm really, really hoping that I'll, I'll become a deacon or get some kind of a title or position in the church, and, and, and they're looking at it like you'd look at a corporate setting, right, a business, and you're working your way up or what have you. That's the spirit of a hireling. And we can have that spirit in us and not be aware of it. But what God is looking for is people that have a heart like a shepherd that simply wants to abide in the field, that wants to love, that wants to bless, that wants to serve, that finds the fulfillment 
in having relationships within the flock, the church God's called them to. And you know what? If God wants to raise them up, promote them, do whatever he wants with them, it'll flow out of that. And it will be right and it will be good. So a true shepherd, this, oops, I'm getting ahead of myself. So th this is so important to understand because God is speaking from the heavenlies in the same manner. Wow. In the same manner that these angels began to speak this tremendous revelation, this new thing God was doing into the earth, and he revealed it to these shepherds. Do you realize that he is speaking today? He has spoken throughout the kingdom age. He has spoken for 2,000 years. He'll, he said, I want to speak something fresh and new. I want to birth. I want to birth a revelation of Christ to my people in a fresh new way. And he's done it countless of times through the ages, countless places. But he's looking for a particular people that can hear and receive that message. Isn't that awesome to think? Right now, right now, God wants to speak a word to us, to your life, to this church, to this region. And he is speaking a word. It's up to us to prepare ourselves and be in the position that we can hear it. He did not speak to the religious crowds in Jerusalem. He didn't speak to the Sanhedrin, right? Or the scholars, the doctors of the law. When he looked to speak, he found some lowly shepherds that were abiding in their fields, faithful to their portion, faithful to their call. And we need to be so careful because wise men follow stars, but they don't necessarily have the message. I'm talking about famous TV preachers and celebrities. There are those that will put stars on their poster and put their mug and their poster out and they're, we need to be careful. They may be wise guys. I mean, wise men. Come on. God is speaking through simple country preachers. He's speaking through the simple people that are faithful. Isn't that good to know? Be faithful. Love the church. Be in proper relationship. Love covenant. Respect and honor covenant. They're the ones God's revealing his new move and work in. No, hang in there if you're wondering what's going to go, where we're going here. Shepherds are faithful because they keep covenant. Nothing flashly, nothing complicated, right? Well, did you hear right bishop, reverend, doctor, so-and-so was speaking? Well, okay. Be careful. He may be a wise guy. No, I'm being serious. Does he smell like sheep? <laughs> How many know that's a good thing? Sniff on them. Do they smell like sheep or do they smell like costly cologne? No, there's a truth to that. Because God, God safeguards this whole thing. God gives us understanding that he wants to speak through those that have covenant with their brothers and sisters. Those that are in a place of accountability. Right? Not people that are just, you know, up on, a, up on a pedestal and they're just speaking and declaring things and everyone's grabbing it. Whoa, 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 wait a minute. There's a way God has established to confirm it. Stars may be fascinating, but they can draw you away. They can get you caught up in the heavenlies and miss it. Huh. Well, I'm going to leave that there. Look at verse 8. We, we saw it. Shepherds watched over their flock by night. Boy, that's good. Shepherds watch over the flock by by night or in the night. And I think it's interesting. It does not say they watch you or they, 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 they look at you, but they're watching over you. <laughs> God does not expect a man, and you do not need a man, to watch every detail of your life, right? To pray about every little thing, to hold your hand, to tell you what's right and wrong, where to go, what to do. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. Thank God. That's the work of the great the great shepherd and the Holy Spirit. Nonetheless, God gives true shepherds in a flock. He gives them an anointing and he gives them an ability to look over the church and to be able to discern and see where is the church? Where are we going? 
He gives them the ability to see you as a shepherd and gives them a special anointing by the virtue that he loves you and he's given us particular gifting and calling to help you in certain ways. And shepherds, if they're anointed and they're operating in their gift, they can look over a flock and go, hmm, I think so-and-so is being troubled. I think so-and-so is under attack. I think this one is being stirred and, and beginning to be drawn away. I see, I see something happening, and God gives the shepherds the discernment and then the word to help minister to the flock, okay? Especially in the night season. That's really important, especially in the night season. I'm so glad that I could just watch over you and not have to watch you, look at you, what did God say to Jeremiah? Don't look at their faces. <laughs> Hallelujah. Again, it's the church. I'm just sharing with you. You know, it, it, what has happened in the church is this undue pressure <laughs> that's put on shepherds oftentimes that they got to have every detail worked out for you. They got to understand everything that's happening in your life, how to pray for you. They got to anticipate before something even happens that, that you should have special attention. And, uh, you know, there's an offense. If you don't go to their kid's graduation or their birthday party or what have you, you might laugh at that. But can I tell you, in most American churches, there's, that's very real. And what happens is... What happens is pastors get intimidated. They, they begin to draw back. They put all this pressure on themselves like they got to please everybody. They got to know everything everyone needs and they got to please everybody's individual need. And what that ends up doing is putting them in such a bondage because they can't do it. They can't do it and they're not supposed to do it. <laughs> but they're anointed to watch over. You're anointed to watch over and care for your brother and care for your sister. Come on, how much can a person hear from God? Shepherds have got to hear God, watch over the flock, direct the flock. Sure, they see when God, when something's happening, God will show them. And then they, they're proactive because of their relationship with you and, and they'll reach out to minister to you. But there are night seasons that we all go through. Churches go through night seasons. People go through night seasons. We go through uh, uh, dark times. And God gives shepherds, true shepherds in a flock, he gives them the ability, come on, to see in the night seasons and help us when we're, we're not sure where we're going, what we're doing. Things seem dark. Things don't seem to be happening. How many of you ever been in a mess? Come on, everyone gets in a mess. Churches get in a mess. People get in a mess. You cannot live this life and live for Jesus and not find yourself in times in what you could call nothing other than a mess. Sheep fall in mud. They get stuck. They get in a mess. Everyone gets in a mess. Some of it's your own doings. Some of it just happens. <laughs> Good news. God gives shepherds night vision to see oftentimes not only why you're in the mess, uh, mess, but how to help you. Don't despise your mess because it's how you get a message. Right? Get me out of this mess. The Lord says, sure, no problem. When you get a message from it. In every mess, there is a message. Help us, Lord, to have the right perspective, whatever our mess is. Whether it's our doing, it just happened to happen. It's part of being part of the group. We're in a mess. Hallelujah. It's good. You know why God allows us to be in a mess? Because it's in the mess. We get humbled, broken. We realize we can't get out of it ourselves. We're bewildered. We're crying out to God. And in the mess, God is faithful, come on, to speak to us and instruct us. You know what a message is? It's a mess with some age on it. A message is a mess with, the, with God's appointed age or time in it. Whatever that time is to bring us to the revelation of why we're in the mess, what we've learned from it, how we've drawn closer to God, how we've received an impartation of his life and more of him, then out of our mess we get a message that can minister to others. Well, how long is my mess? Till you have enough age in it, till it becomes a message, and you can come out of it 
not full of mud, complaining and whining, but saying, let me tell you what I've learned. Would you rather have someone come to you and just quote scriptures at you and tell you someone else's story when you're in a mess? Or would you rather them come to you and go, hey, I've been in that mess. I was in that mess. But let me share with you what the Lord told me, how the Lord spoke to me, how the Lord changed me. I think God's telling you this in the midst of your mess. Come on, have you been in a mess? The church gets in a mess? Well, God gives pastors and shepherds a special anointing, come on, to look over. Have you ever seen these soldiers that have those goggles? Night goggles, night vision. They're amazing, that's an amazing technology. And I believe God will give certain shepherds in the flock, he'll give them these goggles, he'll give them these, this night vision to help us see us in our dark places, in our mess, that they might minister, that they might help us, that they might help bring us out of the mess. Thank God. Listen, to look over the flock just isn't to see what's wrong. Well, let me see what's wrong with you all. How about looking to see all the good things and what's right with you all? Because you know what? A true shepherd just doesn't see what's wrong. My God, they look and they see what's right. They look and see anointings and giftings. They look and see potential. They look and see oftentimes in people's lives what they don't even see. And oftentimes it isn't until the mess that it's brought forth. Oh, Lord. I can tell you one thing. In pastoring all these years, I've seen a lot of mess. We've seen a lot of mess. Shepherds here, we've seen a lot of mess. So what's kept us going? We were able to look over. <laughs> we are able to look over beyond and see that there's a brightness, that there is a breakthrough, that there's something better coming. I don't care how dark it gets. I don't care how much you think your life is a mess. Please understand. God's using it for something. And God's going to use it that you can then turn and minister to others. Amen? Aren't you thankful? All right, look at this. Did we do verse 9? Oh, yeah, let's go. Yeah. No, we didn't. Verse 9 through 14. Let's look at it. Yeah. Yeah. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were so afraid. I guess so. Did I, did I read this? I read this, didn't I? No. And, and the angel said, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Hallelujah. Interesting. The angels did not preach the gospel. The angels delivered a message. Angels deliver messages to people, but they do not have the privilege, come on, to preach the gospel. People do. What an what a honor. What a privilege you and I have to, to preach and declare the good news. That was the shepherd's commission. And this message, right here in the beginning, it's declared. It's good tidings of great joy. Hmm. The message we preach about Jesus, his birth, the gospel, it must be good tidings of great joy. Amen? If that's not what we're preaching, that's another gospel. The, the angels didn't appear in all their glory and say, huh, Unto you a child is born. Fall on your face and writhe in, 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 in condemnation and judgment. For the fire of God will come if you don't. He, they brought good news. The gospel is good news. Hallelujah. And I love what they said. They said something so powerful that we can't miss it. They said that unto you is born a Savior who is Christ the Lord. They could have said that anyway. Do you believe the words are what God wanted them to be? Every word is literally God's word and his order and his way. And, sh and who shall come to you? The Savior, Christ the Lord. The Savior. It speaks of our revelation and walking God, every one of us. Our first revelation is he's Jesus, my Savior. He's my Savior. That's how I enter into this new life. Then he becomes Christ. 
I see him as a man. I learn who he is. I walk with him. I receive the anointing, the Christ, and ultimately is to become, come on, a disciple, and he is Lord, Savior, Christ the Lord. And this is what I love. They began to sing and rejoice when the Son of God was born. Do you realize every time a child of God is born, the same thing happens? Every time Jesus has a, has a baby brother or sister, in all the course of the history of the world, that same scene is played out. And all the angels are singing and rejoicing. I don't know about you, but that blesses me. The day I got saved, come on, the heavens were filled. And angels began to sing and rejoice. Doesn't that what, didn't that what Jesus said? Re- all of heaven's rejoicing when per- one person Get saved. So if you're struggling with insignificance or inferiority, you got a problem with self-esteem, be encouraged. The day you got born, the day you were born again, the heavens sang and rejoiced like they did the day Jesus was born. Boy, that's good news. Now, the shepherds, look at verse 15. Do we have that? Okay. Okay. And it came to pass, as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us now go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. And the Bible says that they they said one to another, or they consulted one to another. This is so powerful. This is a kingdom principle. They received this revelation, and they consulted one to another before they ran and went forth to declare what they had seen. Powerful principle in the things of God. Whenever anyone receives or they believe they receive a fresh revelation from God that's outside that which has already been confirmed and established, hmm, safety says they're going to go and they're going to consult right, with other shepherds, with other pastors, with other leaders to see if this thing is truly so. I don't believe God gives a revelation. I don't believe God ever speaks and does a new thing on the earth or he'll give one individual that revelation. He always, as a sense of safety, he always speaks to more than one. And it's a confirmation. It's a good thing. We've got too many folks prophesying. I mean prophesying. The safety is, how do we know this is a true revelation? How do we know God is really speaking this today? It's not coming from one individual. It's coming from a group that God has brought together, and they confer one with another, and they confirm it. That's the joy of what we're doing here in Salem. It's not about one person saying, this is what God is saying, and this is what we need to do, and everyone going, oh, no, no. God said that he's going to bring his people together. Pastors are coming together, and each one of them are hearing the same thing, but we're hearing different details and different aspects of it. And as we come together, we join in that, and we have a clear message, and then the confidence to come and declare it. Very important. And look what they said. Let us go see this thing. That doesn't sound very respectful. (laughs) <laughs> the angels are announcing the birth of Jesus. And they go, wow, this is really awesome. Let's go see this thing. Well, what did Gabriel say to Mary? This holy thing that is born in you. Thing. That's so interesting. You know what it speaks to me of? It speaks to me that there's more to it as glorious and awesome as it is, is the incarnation and and, and God taking flesh and being birthed in Jerusalem. Uh, The God-man, come on, being birthed on the earth is more than an individual. He's bringing forth a new thing. God is moving on the earth today. God is moving 2021, entering into 2022. God is speaking right here and in this city He's declaring something, a revelation, something's being birthed in Christ, of Christ, but it develops into and ultimately is a new thing. It's a new expression and demonstration of the kingdom. Isaiah said, behold, I do a new thing. God is constantly doing a new thing, and it flows out of the manifestation of a person. Are you with me? (laughs) 
I, I don't want to get too far out. But what a truth. What a powerful truth. I don't want to just celebrate Jesus. I, I, I want to understand in embracing Jesus, out of embracing him, worshiping him, seeking him, it will bring forth a new thing, an expression of the kingdom, a new revelation of the kingdom, a new direction of the kingdom that I can embrace and be part of. Lord, do a new thing in Salem. Do a new thing in my life. It will be centered in a greater revelation of Christ, but it's not just in that. You see, all over the world, people are celebrating this time of the year. They're celebrating uh, the birth of Jesus and totally ignorant to what that means to them and how that applies to them. We can do that as Christians. Hey, let's celebrate the birth of Jesus. Let's talk about the resurrection of Jesus. All oh, that's wonderful, but how has that revelation impacted you and I? How has that brought a revelation of the thing that he is now doing on the earth? To me, that's profound. I don't want to just study about Jesus. I want to know what expression and revelation of Jesus in my life today is going to give me an understanding of my part in his purpose and fulfilling that. Being part of a new thing he's doing in the earth. He's doing a new thing in Salem. He's doing a new thing in this church no matter what we see or what we understand. It comes with a revelation of who he is, but with that, we have to embrace that thing. And it's being spoken and brought to us through shepherds, not wise men, not someone out somewhere in another land, another city. No, it's birthed right here. The faithful ones, abiding shepherds, are hearing it here and bringing the word. There's a new thing God's doing. And that excites me. Now, I don't want to belabor the point, but the first time Jesus appeared and announced by God, right, uh, was to his faithful servants. And this is, we need to be careful with wise men. I don't want to rip on wise men. We just need to be careful. Because wise men have their head in the stars. They look for signs and stars. And really the reproach of the church, especially lately, not lately, 20, 30, 40 years. We've got too many wise men that have their heads up in the stars and they're all consumed with prophesying and predicting the end of the world or when Jesus is going to return. And these stars are aligned and they get their charts and they get their graphs and write their books about why the Lord's going to return and when he's going to return and this egg on our face. Because it doesn't happen. But then they write the sequel why what I prophesied and believed was going to happen didn't happen, and people still buy the books. Why? We're enamored with the end times, right? We're enamored with this. All I'm trying to say is be careful. We do not have to hear from wise men who have their head up in the sky looking for stars and signs. God has given faithful shepherds that he's delivering the word to. And you can receive them because they walk with you. You know them. They've proven faithful. They're in covenant with you. And you can have a prophetic anointing as a pastor or a shepherd. You better. I'm not going to get into about some of the stuff that's been going on, but you get the point. But here's my point. As a shepherd, we are responsible to feed. Not necessarily teach. There's a difference between feeding and teaching. Teaching is sharing with you the principles, the laws. We're giving information about the, uh, the kingdom of God, about Jesus, so that we can be informed and we can grow and learn. That's important. If anything we need in the body of Christ today, it's more teaching. We need teaching to ground us, but that's not necessarily feeding God gives a special anointing to shepherds to feed the flock. What does that mean? Feeding is another expression of teaching. Feeding means, hey, I know my flock. The Bible says the shepherds should know the condition of their flock. And in having relationship and knowing you, where we're going, then a pastor receives the food or the teaching necessary that will meet your need. Right? There's a big difference. What's being fed in one 
flock is different than maybe what's being fed in another flock. It's not just about, let me see. Let's, let, uh, uh, I love this teaching. This is a good teaching. Let me share this teaching with you. That's not feeding. Feeding is a being so in covenant, be so in tune with the flock, so walking as one with the flock, the Lord gives the discernment and the understanding, this is what we need to eat. This is what God is speaking to us today. This is the kind of nourishment or the menu, right, or the meal that we need today. So in order to truly feed, there's got to be a sensitivity to the Holy Spirit, and there's got to be a, a relationship with the people, and that's when you move from teaching to feeding, and there's a prophetic anointing upon feeding. Every true shepherd should have a prophetic touch on their life so they can hear from God. It's not about, let's go do a series. It's about, I need to feed the flock. What are you saying, God? And you know you're fed if you walk away and you say, you know what, that's what I needed to hear. That made sense. Wow, the pastors must have been in my prayer closet this week, right? I, myself and the shepherds, we have a responsibility, come on, to, 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 to feed the, the lambs, the sheep, but just to teach the goats. Oh my gosh. Do you know that a healthy sheep loves to hang out with the shepherd? They don't feel intimidated. They don't feel condemnation. They don't have aught. Isn't it amazing? The natural demonstration of a shepherd and a sheep, of all the things in life that God could have chosen to give us understanding of a relationship between a, 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 a shepherd and the sheep or, 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 or a pastor and the people. He chose sheep and shepherd. And a healthy sheep likes to go close to the shepherd, likes to hang with the shepherd. As a matter of fact, he used to feed them from his hand, certain sheep that liked to be close to the shepherd. There was a relationship that was so important. And that's why Proverbs 27, it says, a good shepherd knows the state of his flocks to feed and to receive wool <laughs> from the sheep and to receive milk from the goat. In every church, there's sheep and there's a few goat. Did you know that? But God doesn't say kick out the goat. He said, let them hang with the sheep. They're part of the flock. Milk them. In other words, you know what a goat is, but, 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 but. Yeah, yeah, but. Okay, but, 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 but. God says, don't kick them out. He says, milk them. If they're tithing and they're serving and they're doing something, continue to receive from them. Milk them. They're still profitable. But the sheep you teach, the sheep you feed, See, there's three kinds of people in every flock. There's sheep, like all you guys. There's goats and there's wolves. And so what do we do? A pastor understands that he feeds the sheep, he milks the goats, and he throws out the wolves. Are you with me? It's interesting. Because God gives God gives the shepherd the privilege to receive the wool from the sheep, right? If he feeds well, then he, he is privileged to receive the wool. Not the wise men. Not, not the itinerant minister. If you want to give a blessing to another ministry, you really should, especially when the Lord puts it on your heart. But your wool, it belongs in the local house. Can you hear that? If someone is going to give themselves to teach, preach, watch over you, care for you, drive the wolves off your life, then you and you're healthy and you, gotta, you need to allow them to shear you, not for his personal benefit. We live in this American thing. I tell you what, we think a successful church is numbering the sheep and God says, don't number them, weigh them. How much do you weigh? 
How much does this church weigh in the spirit? How much wool are we producing? It comes back to the pastors and the shepherds ministry. Okay. I just want you all to know if, if, if we go over, it's because, because no one will get a clock. <laughs> I don't know. Get a clock yourself. Okay, where are we at? Okay, let me, let me, let me close it with this thing. This is very important. Look at 1 Samuel 16, verse 1. I want to just bring this all, all of this to this place. Look at first. And the Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go, and I send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided me a king among his sons. Now look at verse 11. Here's the response. And Samuel said unto Jesse, Are there any other children? He looked at the, you know, the seven brothers. He said, well, yeah, there remain the youngest. And behold, he keeps the sheep. And Samuel said unto him, Jesse, send and fetch him, for we will not sit down till he comes hither. I needed to do a little King James on this this morning. The, the Bible Paul used, right? It used to be a funny joke. It's so old and dead. You can only tell the joke so many times, right? You're gracious. There remains and beholds he keeps. There remains and behold he keeps. What's the number one thing God is looking for to pour out a fresh anointing, to raise you up, promote you to be a giant killer, to be part of a remnant church? What is God looking for? He's looking for this simple thing. He's looking for those that remain and keep. Mm. Anybody can start. It's about being loyal and faithful to finish. Are you hearing me? And both of these words are covenant words. They're covenant words. The word remain means to reserve a remnant. What's God looking? What's he looking for in Salem? What's he looking for today in his body? Who's he going to speak afresh to and raise up and pour his oil upon and call to a new thing to be part of a new move of God? He's looking for those that have these qualities that have been worked into their life. They remain. They're standing. They are steadfast. They've been through a mess. They've gone through this and that and this disappointment and this uh, contradiction. And half the time they didn't know whether they were coming or they were going. But they remained faithful. And God has a premium. God has a premium on our faithfulness and remaining than our ambitions or our offense. Or whatever it is that separates us. The remnant are those that have remained Hallelujah. You see, we look, like, we look at it like the people that God is really using, the special ones, and they have positions, and they're being used this way or that way. You've got to hear this. But it contradicts our own thinking oftentimes. What is God looking for? Can you remain? Yeah, I'm remaining, but nothing's happening, and I've been remaining for years and years and years, and it looks like, God, God, you must have overlooked me. You must not even see how faithful I've been in serving and doing my ministry. And God says, ah, oh, no, I've been watching. I've watched you remain. And I believe God is coming to his church in this hour. I believe he's coming to this church, and he's got his horn of oil, like Samuel the prophet. Come on, he was almost fooled, wasn't he? He looked at those seven sons of, of, of Jesse, good-looking, strapping young man. Any one of them from the natural eye looked like they could be king. And then, and then he said, well, wait a minute. Holy Spirit said, wait, wait, wait. Do you have another one? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There, there, there's David, the runt. There's David, the young one. Oh, yeah, he, 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 remains, he remains out there with the flock. He's just keeping the flock, but he's just David. He gave himself away to the prophet when he used covenant words. Ha! Huh. Oh yeah, there's David. Yeah. He remains and keeps the flock. Go get him. Go get him. He's the one. I believe God's about to pour, lift his horn over top of the churches of Salem, of this church, and he's getting ready to pour out that anointing. He's pouring out something so fresh to a remnant people that has simply stood. God's heard your prayer. He's heard you. How many of you, don't raise your hand. 
What am I doing? How long? Where is all this going? All I know is just what I know. I'm here. And all along, God is working something in you, testing you, pouring into you, preparing you as a remnant group, those that remain. Many have come and gone, and that's up to God, between them and God, no judgment. But I don't know about you, but I remain. By the grace of God, I've remained. Because I want to be part of a remnant group. And I can tell you one thing, just as a testimony, and you know I'll testify. If I'm going to use my life as an example, I'll use it as the negative things I've done as much as the right things I've done. But one thing God gave me the grace for, when I was in Baltimore for 18 years, and I knew for, for 17 of those years I was called to fulfill a purpose, called to ministry, all that jazz, but I was one among 20 young bucks. Great words over their life. And I watched over the years, one after another, be raised up and they go out. And I go up in here longer than that guy. I put up with more than that guy. I've been through more than that guy. Come on, be real. That's not fair. And, and I finally got a revelation, and I had a couple prophets look at me between the eyes and set me straight. You got the best part. You've got the best part. Hang in there. Remain. God's doing something. He's doing something that you needed that time. Just remain. Keep clean. Stay sweet. Do your best to stay sweet. And my testimony is this. And I don't say this in any way, but with sorrow. Everyone but one of them that went out shipwrecked. No, I'm, ser I'm serious as could be. There's one, Brother Jerry Schwartz. He's pastoring in Philadelphia. And you know what I did? I went there for six months on Friday night with the band and preached and built that church up. And I thought I was going to go be the pastor. We had our bags packed, ready to go. And a prophet is in town. And he looks at me, doesn't know anything, and says, unpack your bags. You're not going where you think you're going. You need to remain right here for this season. And you talk about... <sighs> it was God's timing. And I thank God for it. I don't want anything else than what God's called me to do. I don't want anybody else, else's portion. I'm so thankful. But I had to learn something. I had to learn to remain. Amen? It's okay to smell like sheep, because we are sheep. Can you, see, can you see David's older brothers? They hear the prophets coming. They're getting, they're getting their fragrance. They're getting their old spice. And their, uh, I don't know what they have, curve. In my days, it was English leather and, and, and jade. Jute, what is it? I don't know. Canoe. That was what I wore when I was cool when I was in high school, right? They're getting themselves all sprayed up and looking good and getting ready. The prophet's coming in town. He looks right over him and says, I don't like your smell. You got anyone else? Oh, you got stinky. We got stinky David. He smells like cheap poop. <laughs> ah, it's the fragrance that blesses me. <laughs> he remaineth and he keepeth. Both are covenant terms. Keepeth means this, to tend, to rule, to associate with as a companion, to keep company with. And God is looking and saying, in this day, in this day that I'm speaking afresh and anew, I'm looking for one that not only remains, but one that keepeth, keeps. In other words, they have a heart for the sheep. They love people. They're committed to the church. They're committed to one another. I want to tell you, God loves that. Do you love the church? Do you love one another? God will test that, won't he? Come on, every one of us has been through that test. Are we going to get offended or are we going to pray for our brother and sister? Are we going to stand with our brother and sister? Interesting, he said, he that keepeth the flock, are you not your brother's keeper? Keeper is a quality God works in us where we love our brothers and sisters. We're committed to them. We're committed to pray with them, stand with them, work with them. Church has failed. Church has failed the past few years. 
And so many of us have made choices. We've made choices based on culture or ethnicity and not the kingdom. When we're supposed to be all coming together and standing together as brothers and sisters and demonstrating to the world there's something truly different about us and there is this one named Jesus that we love and worship. We've allowed the enemy and we've allowed the ways of the world to separate us. There's one race. I don't know where I'm going with all this. God help me. There's one race. Many different ethnic backgrounds. Thank God. There's only two kinds of people on the earth. Those born again and alive in Christ and those that are dead in their sins. God, bring us together. Bring us together, oh God. And God is testing the church and say, can we walk with one that's different than you? Can you embrace? Can you keep the one that's different than you? That's so important. Can we embrace one another? Are we going to be critical? Or are we going to celebrate that they're different than we are? And God's saying... Can we embrace, if some high and mighty noble person walked through these doors, an athlete or a, a, a politician, are we going to esteem them higher than a person that comes in that's homeless or broken or in need? You'll say you wouldn't. Oh, God, help us. No matter who he sends us, we embrace them as one made in his image and likeness. He'll test our hearts. I remember a prophet said one time, take the one no one wants and God will give you the ones everyone's after. There's probably truth in that, isn't it? God help us. I don't know about you. I'm more easy with the down and outers than I am the high and mighty. I don't know. I'm more comfortable with those folks. Have you ever had dinner? Have you ever had to eat dinner with these fancy people? <laughs> Be careful. You gotta be careful about how you hold your finger and how you, you use your forks and knives and where you put your napkin and don't don't ting don't hit your tooth with the with the utensil and oh my god I just want to eat <laughs> right manja Lord Jesus have mercy <laughs> okay I need to close and I am but this. There's a great challenge that's coming to our church in this coming year. And Lord willing, we're going to embrace it. In the months that are ahead, we're going to enter into a wonderful new dynamic as part of the body of Christ in Salem. God is truly, 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 he's bringing the pastors and the flocks and the churches all together into a dynamic that we have not experienced before. We've not been this way here before. He's bringing the pastors together as one. He's bringing the flocks together as one. A new wineskin. And God is challenging the pastors to tear down the walls, tear down the barriers, the territorial walls we've erected because of fear and intimidation and, and, and you know, trying to hold our rights and keep people and all that. God's challenging the pastors and saying, if you're in, it's no longer a time to talk about it. Are we willing to let other shepherds shepherd us? Are we willing to be part of a new church system, a wineskin? where we allow other pastors to come and teach us, we send, we go and get equipped by others, that we literally identify ourselves as brothers and sisters in one church. You know what the challenge is? The challenge is folks aren't like you. Folks aren't like me. <laughs> Thank God. People in other churches, I've experienced this. It's not a revelation, but there's people in other churches <coughs> that have other cultures. <clears throat> they have other ways of doing things. They have different giftings, different expressions. Thank God. We're so limited in who we have been. God wants to enlarge us and to embrace the giftings and the callings and the ethnicity and, and the, uh, the, the, the expressions of other people. And in doing so, guess what? We've got to learn to be patient. We've got to learn to be open to learn. We've got to be people that learn how to remaineth and keepeth. 
because he's going to judge. He's going to look at all of us as he's pulling us together. And if we've got an attitude, if we can't embrace people that look different, act people different, talk different, worship different, then we are foolish. And we fail. And we will not see that holy oil flow down upon us. Confession. God's dealt with me so heavy. God has dealt with me. And if you want to learn something, learn from my, my weakness. Because God has shown me something. Been here 23 years with a heart that has not changed. A vision that's not changed for just what I said. But now I realize there is stuff in my own life hindering and frustrating and blocking the work of God to do the very thing he's called me and the church to do. You know why? Because I've had spiritual pride. I just felt like I knew more than everybody. I'm not not proud of that. I felt like I knew how to do everything. Because after all, you know, I've, I've had the experience. I've done more than all you guys. And, you know, hey, God gave me the revelation. And you just, just kind of like listen up and let's go do it. And guess what? That doesn't work. It doesn't work whether it's the church or you're leading your family, a business. It doesn't work. So God takes you through a process to break you, to humble you, to get right perspective and realize you're just one piece. You're one part of something beautiful God is doing. Be willing to be humble and learn and just present and offer yourself. You know what the Lord said? You want to see this happen? Don't, don't impress people with what you know. Love them and serve them. Just love them and serve them. That works. That works. God is doing that. God says, Lou, you got to learn how to just remaineth and keepeth. Serve, love, give. I'm not there totally, but I sure am learning, and I'm seeing the fruit of it. When I see what God is doing in the church and the prospects of what he's about to do in this coming year, I'm overjoyed. I've seen, I've, I have literally been blessed, ministered to, received revelation by these broken men and women of God, these leaders. There is a great group of pastors and shepherds in Salem. There really is. Talented, anointed, different giftings and callings. Humility, the brokenness. And I'm going, oh my God, thank you. What a privilege to be part of this group. I see it, God. I see it, and you did it. You did it because we're all learning just to lay it all down. And that you be God and you do it. But even in that, there's the challenge of this church. That does not negate the call you have. We still are called to lead. We're still called to be a standard bearer. It doesn't lessen our calling, but puts it in perspective. And I believe what God's about to do is so powerful. And I believe his horn is full of oil. He's pouring it out over his people. And it's not about how great you are. It's not about how much knowledge you have. It's not about your pedigree. It's not about anything other than I love the church. I love God's people. And I'm faithful and I'm committed. And I'll be a humble servant. And I'll let God call me out of the field and pour his oil on my head in his timing in his purpose. So what's the, what do I leave you with? Stand. I leave you with simply this. Again, not self-promoting. You know what I believe? We got the greatest shepherds in this church. For this church, the size of this church, what God has given us. Pastor Ken, Pastor Paul, let me tell you something. What a richness, what righteous men of God, gifted, talented, the right blend that God's put together. We're blessed. And I pray that you strengthen your relationship with them, honor them. I can tell you this because I meet with them all the time. And I pray with them, their heart is for you. There's no guile. There's no guile. There's no intent. There's no self-promotion. Nobody's looking to be a star or a wise man. (laughs) We're just humble shepherds placed in this flock. And it's a privilege. I want to encourage you to work on your relationship with them. Honor them. Bless them. Thank God for them. Strengthen your relationship with them. 
Because here's the principle. The measure you honor someone that God has given you in that capacity is the measure then you will receive to have authority and an anointing to minister to others. God's calling you to pastor. God's calling you to pastor. Husbands, pastor your wives. That's not a negative thing. Parents, pastor your children. Pastor the ones, shepherd those that God has given unto you and given you influence over. Shepherd those in your ministry. Shepherd people at the job or at school. Realize you have an anointing. And if we all rise up to that new level and that revelation, we're going to see God move and do great things. How many of you can say, I want to remaineth and keepeth and I'm going to position myself because I love the church. I'm positioning myself to receive the fresh, fresh outpouring of God's oil. Father, different kind of message this morning, but Lord, I, I, I thank you for this people. I thank you for their brokenness. I thank you for their humility. I thank you that they do recognize that they are their brother's keeper. I thank you for a faithful remnant that has remained. I thank you for a people, Lord, that hear and receive and, and, and learn and, and receive that which has been fed. I, I thank you, God, for how much this church weighs. My God, we weigh so much in the spirit. And I pray that you bring us into a new place where we begin to operate in that pastoral shepherding anointing that you've placed upon every one of us, God. Father, I thank you. We give you praise. We give you glory. Can you receive the basic message of this this morning? Be encouraged. Be encouraged. Let's strengthen our relationships with one another as we go into this new year.